This week, Coach Denzel Washington leads a newly integrated high school football team. And remember the Titans. Police Captain Morgan Freeman investigates attorney Gene Hackman for murder in Under Suspicion. And The Exorcist is back with new scenes and a new ending. school board made the decision to put you on my staff, I did not hire you. I didn't ask to be assigned to your staff, so I guess we're both in a situation we don't want to be in. But I can guarantee you this, Coach. I come to win. Denzel Washington faces opposition as the newly appointed football coach when a Virginia high school is integrated in Remember the Titans, one of the new movies we'll review this week. We'll also preview some movies that premiered at the Toronto Film Festival and talk about the ratings battle between Hollywood and Washington. I'm Richard Roper, columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. And Remember the Titans links the integration of Southern high schools with the excitement of a sports movie to make us feel very good, although at times I wasn't always sure if I was happy because the team was integrated or because the team was winning. <laughs> Denzel Washington plays an African-American coach promoted against his will to the position of head coach at a newly integrated high school. The popular white coach who had been at the school, played by Will Patton, becomes his assistant. In Alexandria, Virginia, in 1971, a black man coaching white players was unheard of. Washington's character, based on the real-life coach Herman Boone, has got to establish his authority. I want all of my defensive players on this side, all players going out for offense over here. Right now, get comfortable, too. Because the person that I have you sitting next to is the same one that you'll be rooming with for the duration of this camp. By training together, the blacks and whites on the team begin to bond. But at first, it's not easy. Ryan Hurst plays the captain. Wood Harris plays a lineman who doesn't think it's a level playing field. You the captain, right? Right. Captain's supposed to be the leader, right? Right. You got a job? I have a you job. You've been doing your job? I've been doing my job. Then why don't you tell your white buddies to block for Rev better? Because they have not blocked for him. Work a plug nickel, and you know it. Nobody plays. Yourself included. I'm supposed to wear myself out for the team? What team? Remember the Titans was directed by Boaz Yaquin, who made the wonderful 1994 movie Fresh. And he's clever here in the way he links the social message of this film to the formula of the traditional sports movie. The movie starts off by being about race relations and it ends up being about winning the big game. And it follows the unwritten law, of course, that everything is settled in the last second of the last game. I really found myself involved in the film, though, partly because of the convincing performances of Denzel Washington and Will Patton and partly because... The team members are well cast and well written and put the lessons of the movie into practice. Yeah, there were times when you knew exactly what was going to happen, yeah. but it was okay because you had invested uh, the time mm -hmm. and the effort into the characters. Will Patton usually plays a psycho or a creep or the <laughs> bad guy, and it was nice to see him play the single yeah. father. There, was a lot of nice, there were a lot of nice scenes with him and his daughter. You know, I played football on an integrated team a little bit later than this and not in the South, but some of the scenes in this movie really rang true for me because it's true. On the practice field, you'd bond with the black guys. When you go to school, it's not the same thing. It's a different world. And they did a nice job of showing some of the scenes in the classrooms mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the, team are, the teammates are together, but the rest of the school doesn't understand how they can be together. And there's a scene with a guy and his girlfriend who doesn't understand it. All that comes together, and yeah, it ends up with a big game. But we deserve the big game in a movie like this. We want to root for these guys. Yeah, we don't want, and, we, and we don't want the movie to end uh, no. with We Shall Overcome. We want it to end with a... Right. Touchdown, if possible. And it's a little bittersweet one, because of certain things that happen to certain characters One nice well. thing is they don't make Denzel Washington into this kind of unbelievably heroic and noble person no. and the white coach, uh, Will Patton, into some kind of a racist. Patton has some suggestions to make to Washington that are on the money because Washington is not necessarily a perfect coach. He's more of a hardliner, actually. Yeah. Will Patton's character has a little bit more humanity. Mm -hmm. So a really great job, and we like this one a lot. Yeah. Okay, our next movie is the reissue of The Exorcist which has been possessed by 11 minutes of previously unreleased footage and six-track digital sound. The adaptation of William Peter Blatty's controversial novel caused a sensation and shattered box office records when it opened in late 1973, shocking and delighting audiences with its blasphemous language and the gruesome special effects. But some of the most effective scenes are the quiet moments that hint of darker things to come. You been playing with it? Yep. You know how? I'll show you. That's the wonderful Ellen Burstyn as the divorced mother of Linda Blair's Regan, whose bedroom becomes a carnival for the devil. <laughs> 
In addition to the much lampooned images of Regan's head swiveling and the infamous projectile vomiting, we get a first look at some other and equally disturbing effects as when Regan emerges from her bedroom. Director William Friedkin is a master of pacing. He doesn't hammer us with shock after shock. He builds the tension and allows time for us to empathize with the priest as well as Regan and her mother. And then he pins our ears back. Now, just as Jaws wasn't only about seeing the shark, The Exorcist isn't only about seeing the God versus Satan showdown. Most of all, it's about the fears inside us. Yes, it is. And it's not just a freak show, but it's about good and evil. And it really has a resonance, for me anyway, that has to do with the fact that the devil... Uh, it seems to be inside this girl, and these people are fighting for her soul. But, you know, this movie has the extra 11 minutes, and mm -hmm. I think it's only in there in order to justify a theatrical release and a new video, so you have to replace the video you might already have. It's not necessary, the new footage, and in particular at the end, mm -hmm. the original movie ends perfectly with the surviving priest getting the medal from the girl's mother right. and the car drives off. Now we have this new ending. He gives the medal back to her, then he goes back and talks to the detective, and the detective has this nonsensical dialogue about some hypothetical version of Wuthering Heights starring Jackie Gleason and Lucille Ball, yeah. and it's like a comedian who doesn't know well, when he got to his punchline. The movie is over. What are they blathering about? It's, it's a like it bit destroys right. the mood of the whole ending of the I film. I don't think it destroys the mood at all. It's a little bit mannered, and they have this running joke throughout the movie mm -hmm. where the detective comes up with wacky casts for movies. But mm -hmm. you know what? This is such a thrill ride and such a roller coaster ride that at the end, a little bit of business tacked on at the end, we're sort of getting out of our seat already. So it didn't in mm -hmm. any way, in fact, until you mentioned it, it didn't even affect well, you know, me at all. Whole... And I like the, way, the, the extra scene, the weird thing of Regan coming down the stairs, some of the opening exposition. The sound is also very much improved. And this is a movie that really uses oh, sound, sound fine, but you know, the whole thing about So I think it is worth revisiting with the new stuff in it. Uh, but the whole thing about director's cuts is, it was something the director has always wanted to do, but Friedkin said for 25 years that he was very happy with the movie. Now I think you're looking basically at a marketing ploy. Well, it's still a great movie, I think. Okay, coming up later in the show, movies for you to look forward to from this year's Toronto Film Festival. And coming up next, Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman in the crime story, Under you know, Suspicion. Now, in the whole area, you're the only one who remembers correctly. Who am I to believe? Them? Naturally. Oh, come on, Henry. You're taking this personally. I'm just trying to find the truth. You know, you enjoy hounding me. Morgan Freeman is a police captain, and Gene Hackman is a wealthy lawyer called in for questioning and under suspicion, a film which circles the possibility that the lawyer has raped and murdered two young girls. Is he guilty or innocent? Freeman has more information than he at first reveals as the interrogation net draws tighter. You called before anyone knew Sue Ellen was missing. Well, does that make me the murderer? <laughs> That's right here. I ran home and called the police. My God, Henry, there must have been several places closer. Hackman is married to a much younger woman played by Monica Bellucci. It's not a happy marriage. How well do they really know each other? I'd like to hear your side. Most interesting things, those I'm sure he kept to himself. Well, not Camille, I'm afraid. That is the reason you sent him down the hall with his toothbrush and watch cloth, isn't it? The movie is set in Puerto Rico and alternates between the tense and angry cross-examination in the police station and scenes visualizing Hackman's story. The director, Stephen Hopkins, uses an interesting device. We see Hackman talking to Freeman, but suddenly he's not in the station. He's in the location that he's describing, and he's still talking. The movie has a surprise ending. It makes a certain amount of sense from a psychological point of view, but it takes a long time to get there. I admired the performances. I was intrigued by the story, but under suspicion was not enough of a drama and too much of a dramatic exercise. I could always see the wheels turning. Well, you mentioned the one thing I liked about this movie was the scenes where they would, where the character who's doing the questioning would then show up on the scene yeah. in the flashback. That was an interesting technique. Other than that, I thought this movie was completely dishonest. Gene Hackman's being asked these questions and he's giving different ver Why does he change his story? They don't give us a good payoff. He changes at the end his story because, his story because Freeman has additional information that shows the story is wrong. But what's Hackman's motivation? And you mentioned the surprise ending. It comes out of nowhere. It doesn't dovetail no, with think, what was set I up think at all. The ending comes from kind of why he changes his story. It has to do. I don't want to give away the ending, but it has to do with his own desire to punish himself. It feels so tacked on to me, this ending, and it didn't have anything to do with what we were seeing the rest of the movie all leading up to no, that. No, I think psychologically so that, it follows. Well, I don't, I don't think it does fo follow okay. psychologically, and I don't think it follows in terms of an honest plot. I think they're just But the whole thing of the movie, the whether the ending mm. works or not, the movie, I think, does kind of overstay its welcome. Don't you absolutely, know? absolutely true. Coming up next, Washington takes on Hollywood, a special report when we come back. 
every single studio executive was either out of the country or unavailable. I can only conclude the industry was too ashamed of or unable to defend their marketing practices. That's Republican Senator John McCain earlier this month scolding the lords of Hollywood for not attending his Commerce Committee hearing on the marketing of R-rated movies to America's youth. The hearings were held after the Federal Trade Commission reported that many entertainment companies, including some film studios, are peddling so-called adult-oriented products to adolescents. For example, kids attending PG movies saw deceptively benign trailers for the R-rated, foul mouth and cheerfully nasty South Park movie. I will do the German dance for you. It's fun and gay and ta la Hope you will enjoy my dance. Fiddly -eye, fiddly -eye. Huh? In this election year, Republicans and Democrats are battling to see which party can see more outraged, in some cases not just by the marketing methods, but by the movies themselves. Lynn Cheney, Republican vice presidential candidate Dick Cheney's wife and former head of the National Endowment for the Humanities, singled out Miramax executive Harvey Weinstein lambasting his controversial 1995 release, Kids. Shouldn't people of stature go to Harvey Weinstein, who is the co-chairman of Miramax, for example, and ask him to pledge that in, in the future he will not fund work that debase our culture and corrode our children's souls. And Democratic vice presidential candidate Joseph Lieberman showed support for his old friend McCain by advocating additional regulations on the film industry if marketing practices aren't reformed. I cannot tell parents that these products are inappropriate for their children in the ratings and then turn around and market them to those same kids. Yet the Democrats continue to cozy up to the industry, lining their pockets at fundraisers thrown by the Hollywood elite. Meanwhile, McCain has issued another invitation to studio chiefs to come to Washington, and this time some of them reportedly may show up. There's enough bipartisan grandstanding and hypocrisy here to fuel a major studio release, but still the practice of targeting R-rated movies to kids is just plain wrong, and the FTC report actually includes some worthwhile suggestions, such as industry sanctions against studios that don't comply with expanded codes regulating the marketing of R movies to kids. But millions of parents are bringing little kids, let alone adolescents, into theaters anyway, and they'll continue to do so no matter what rules are suggested. I guess we're concerned about the parents who are concerned about their kids. And you know, okay. why is it that critics, politicians who criticize Hollywood always pick the good movies to attack, like Lynn Cheney attacking Kids, which was a very good movie right. and a very serious movie about adolescents, instead of picking one of the hundred of junk movies targeted at kids that she always could have chosen. They've seen these now, movies. They ought to screen the movie yeah, first and then talk she, about it I don't afterwards. know if she saw it or not, but she didn't understand it if mm -hmm. she did. That's right. But she's attacking Weinstein because he, rather than release the movie as NC-17, started a new company and released it unrated, right. and she says that was a way to get around the ratings. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was basically Disney, which owns Miramax, won't release an NC-17 movie, and neither will any other major studio no, and won't. that's the they crux won't. we have no workable adult rating in this country so all of this stuff right. has to be pushed into the r rating now the most interesting thing that came out last week was the directors guild of america statement mm -hmm. calling for an overhaul of the rating system and saying something we've been saying on this show for a long time right. nc-17 is worthless it's discredited it's useless we have to have a new adult rating that everybody gets behind and says there is such a thing as an adults-only movie, and it's okay for it to be an adults-only movie. Right. And then the DGA says we have to go ahead and have zero tolerance in enforcing the R rating, yeah, which these the, studios but, don't want because where Jack Bellini and his employers yeah. are all terrified they might lose one single ticket sale. And that's the thing. I mean, okay, that's great. We come up with a new rating system, but as you mentioned, everybody has to get behind it. And you know what? Yeah. They're not going to get behind They're it. They're going to have to. There's and, a lot of pressure. I think we're going to have to say the R rating means something, and there Fine. is such a thing as an A rating. If you have an A rating, it takes mm -hmm. the pressure off the R rating to get all of this objectionable material in there where kids But can how are you it. going to get the studios to get behind the A rating? And once you I, put well, an the A rating... has called for it, and that's very important. Okay, but once you get those movies with those A ratings in the theaters, how are you going to get the kids to stop going into the movie, buying the PG ticket, and then sneaking into the movie I theater think, where the A movie I think is they're showing. Calling you know, for that zero, stuff is always going to happen. They're calling for zero tolerance, and that's, I guess... But, Roger, the problem is the zero tolerance is going to be enforced by kids making six bucks an hour at the theaters who are supposed well, to be watching I, other I kids, and that's not I don't think you can happen. make policy on the basis of whether or not the kids are going to enforce it. You have to hmm. have the policy, and then you have to try to enforce it. It's like okay. any law. And that's fine. We do agree that they shouldn't be marketing these no, movies they to kids. But they got into a lot of discussion about content, and that always frightens me when Washington starts talking about the yeah, content. Don't tell me the um, movies are bad. Just tell us what you're going to do to have a better rating system. There you go. When we come back, the Toronto Film Festival kicks off the fall movie season, and we're going to talk about some discoveries 
that you can look for later this fall. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that all you can claim about me, claim, is that I had sex while Deviant I was... Deviant sex. Oh, who deviant? Who says it was deviant? I do. That's a scene from The Contender, a political movie starring Joan Allen as a senator nominated to replace a deceased vice president. During congressional hearings, her opponent zero in on her sexual history. Most political movies never mention political parties, like we don't have any in this country, but mm -hmm. this one takes sides. It's partisan and it's democratic, but the politics don't get in the way of its thriller aspects. It's one of the new movies that premiered last week at the Toronto Film Festival, most important film event in North America. Here are more Toronto movies you can look forward to. The People's Choice Award, voted on by the filmgoers themselves, went to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. That's what the filmgoers like most. It's Ang Lee's visionary new martial arts epic with special effects that free the characters from the force of gravity and send them soaring over rooftops. The Discovery Award, voted on by more than 700 movie critics at the festival, who knew there were that many movie <laughs> critics, was shared by George Washington, a new American film by David Gordon Green. It tells a haunting story of drifting childhoods against the backdrop of a rusting cityscape, and it is a beautiful film. Second place in the People's Choice Awards went to The Dish, a wonderful comedy from Australia set in a small town that boasts a giant radio telescope that will relay the first TV images as Neil Armstrong walks on the moon in 1969. Pollock was directed by Ed Harris, and he stars in it as Jackson Pollock, the abstract expressionist who made influential art but drowned his own happiness and that of his loved ones in his alcoholic misery. It's harrowing and observant in its story of a life. So it's all the blue that's bothering you, and uh, what else about the color, quiet? To be a little quieter, Jess. Well, let's just quiet the color now. Joel Schumacher says he made Tigerland in an attempt to find himself after those Batman blockbusters he directed. It stars a talented newcomer, Colin Farrell, as a rebel whose free spirit almost derails a Vietnam-era basic training program. Been in the Army more than three months. Most of it in the stockade. Let me give you some Army buddy advice. Figure out a way to get out. Why don't you play the fool who's fighting the system? Both Shakespeare and Love and American Beauty premiered at Toronto and went on to win the Oscars as Best Picture. And of the premieres this year, I think the front runner looks like Almost Famous, Cameron Crowe's movie about a 15-year-old rock critic. And Joan Allen is a candidate for Best Actress, I think, in The Contender. I think she's more of a candidate. I have to say she's the favorite. If there are better performances by women in lead roles coming up later this year, we're going to be looking forward to some great work. And I think it's an important film, The Contender. Two of my favorite political movies of all time, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington mm -hmm. and The Candidate. This is every bit as good as yes, those it is. two classics. Yes, it so, is. And a lot of great it's performances. Very smart. It's very smart. Very smart. And it, the fact that it's political and that it takes sides kind of gives it more of a dangerous feeling. It feels real, absolutely real. Now, while you were in Toronto, I managed to catch in Chicago some of the other films playing up there, including the bleak and yet dazzling Requiem for a Dream, a relentless and unforgettable look at addiction from Darren Aronofsky, who directed the cult favorite, Pi. Angel says that this is the time we should do it now. I'm gonna call Brody tomorrow. Who's Brody? That's my sweet connection. On a much lighter note, I was completely charmed by Billy Elliot, or as I like to call it, the half Monty. Although in this case, the British dancers are kids in tutus. It's a gritty charmer, with young Jamie Bell giving an astonishingly assured performance in the title role. <laughs> I also found a bucket of chuckles in Best in Show, another pitch-perfect ensemble cast satire from Christopher Guest of This Is Final Tap and Waiting for Guffman fame. This time around, Guest and company tap into the rich comic material to be mined from the eccentric world of dog shows, with Fred Willard stealing the movie as a boom-voiced cable commentator with an endless supply of stupid questions and offensive jokes. Why did he put the blood on, put on one of those Sherlock Holmes hats? and put a little pipe in his mouth. Are they ever allowed to do anything like that? Oh, that's Fred Willard in this movie. It's one of those roles where everything he says makes me laugh, and then I laugh 10 seconds later thinking about what he just said. It's really a hilarious performance. He's, he steals the show, you're quite right. You know, I like the movies you talked about and the movies I talked about. It's like when I go to Toronto every year, it renews my faith mm -hmm. in the cinema because in the summer, so many of the movies are just formula pictures, including even the good movies are formula right. pictures. And in the fall, at Toronto, it's like, the really great movies can come out now and safely go into the theaters because the summer is over. And the really, really special things like George Washington, oh, yeah. which just yeah. shows us a whole new world in a whole new way. Just wonderful stuff. That's a real discovery. We'll be right back.
Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this week's show. Two thumbs up for Remember the Titans, the inspiring drama about a newly integrated football team. It opens next week. Two thumbs up for the expanded version of The Exorcist. Two thumbs down for Under Suspicion, despite the strong performances by Gene Hackman and Morgan Freeman. So we've got Remember the Titans, which is a winner, mm -hmm. and The Exorcist in theaters, a chance for people who didn't get the chance to see it the first time or were too young to see it now in, in the big, on the big screen. Right. Remember, you can hear our reviews at eber-roper-movies.com and readers in print at suntimes.com. Next week, more new movies, including The Contender and Best in Show. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.